This is Space Time Series 26, Episode 142, for broadcast on the 27th of November 2023. Coming up on Space Time Discovery of massive mysterious blasts in the distant universe, colliding neutron stars reveal some of their secrets, and your obtuse spacecraft undertakes a key engine burn on its way to Jupiter. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers are baffled by a mysterious series of massive explosions in the distant universe which are emitting more energy than literally hundreds of billions of stars like the Sun. The repeated explosions were observed on September the 7th last year and have now been reported in the journal Nature. They're known as Luminous Fast Blue Optical Transients, or LFBOTs for short. Luminous Fast Blue Optical Transients are rare. They're extremely powerful events, more powerful than a supernova, and they normally evolve on timescales of just a few days, fading away rapidly. However, this latest luminous fast blue optical transient continued to explode with supernova-like energy on multiple occasions, well after the initial burst and fade. One of the study's authors, Professor Jeff Cook from Swinburne University, says an event like this has never been witnessed before. Cook says when a luminous fast blue optical transient explodes, it emits more energy than an entire galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars like the Sun. However, the mechanism behind these massive energy outbursts are still unknown. In this case, after the initial burst and fade, the extreme explosions just kept happening, occurring very fast, often in minutes rather than weeks or months. Instead of fading steadily as one would expect, the source briefly brightened again, then again, then again. Data from multiple observatories, including one with high-speed cameras, detected at least 14 irregular and highly energetic bursts over a 120-day period. However, it's worth pointing out the burst could have been going on a lot longer than that, just that observation time on the telescopes was limited. And so that's all they were able to see. Luminous fast blue optical transients are already weird and exotic events, so this latest discovery makes them even stranger. Cook says this event pushes the limits of physics because of its extreme energy production and also because of the short time duration for the bursts. See, light travels at a finite speed. How fast a source can burst and then fade away limits the size of the source, meaning that all this energy that's been seen is being generated from a relatively small source. Now, the current theory is that a black hole or neutron star was formed by the initial explosion. And that's now in the process of accreting an immense amount of material, causing the subsequent intense bursts. Cook and colleagues monitored the event using the giant 10-metre Keck telescope in Hawaii as part of a larger program of 15 observatories around the world, combined with X-ray observations using NASA's Chandra Space Telescope. Cook says these observations are important to help understand the nature of the source, how massive stars transition during their death throes, and to help find more in order to better understand how common these events are in the universe. I think most people are familiar with supernovae, the explosive death of a massive star, so these things are incredibly bright. They're as bright as almost an entire galaxy of 100 billion stars, so there's very incredible energetic explosion. Well, there are also these events called luminous fast blue optical transients, or LFBOT, and there are only a handful of these, but they're kind of like a supernova, and this is, you know, we found one of these. It's kind of like a supernova, but a supernova will take like, you know, a couple of weeks to rise in brightness because it's this gigantic explosion, and then it takes like a couple of months to fade away. These things take maybe a day or two to rise and about a week to fade away, so they're just really fast, and they can be actually about 100 times brighter than a supernova, so they're incredibly powerful. So firstly, that's interesting because you find one of these things, there's not very many of them, and we don't really know what causes them, but there are some theories. Okay, so that's the start. But secondly, we're monitoring this one that we found, and it gets a, whenever you find a transient, it gets some name, official name. This is AT2022 TSD. It's just some number. But the TSD, you know, instead of using this big name, the TSD made people start thinking Tasmanian Devil. So we kind of 
kind of nicknames it Tasmanian Devil. Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> it makes it easier to talk about and, and it's and it's interesting. So that's fine. And we're monitoring it and sort of serendipitously we're like taking some images of it after it had its incredible explosion, which you think would have obliterated anything that was there. And we're taking some images and it exploded again. And we're like, Oh, that's unusual. I've never seen that before. And, you know, what is there to explode again? So I thought, well, that's interesting. And it exploded again and again and again. And, like, we caught about 14 times that this thing exploded. So it could have been many more because, you know, you're not on the telescope all the time, looking at something all the time. It's just, you know, over a course of many months, you wait for conditions and you get telescope time. So, you know, it could have happened many, many more times. So, but each one of these explosions was as powerful as a supernova. So now you're starting to think, what could possibly explode over and over again? So that's the second unusual thing about this thing. It's never been seen before, something like this. But the third interesting thing is that those explosions only lasted for minutes. So now you've got this incredible amount of energy exploding in just a few minutes. So that is pretty much pushing physics to the extreme because we know that light takes some time to travel through space. And because of that, the amount of time something takes to explode kind of sets a limit to how big that object can be. I mean, you kind of, I guess the way to think about it is if you imagine the sun, which is pretty big, and if it would just do an instantaneous pulse of light, we would not measure this like instantaneous pulse, we'd actually measure maybe something that's like a second or so long because light from maybe the front of it that's facing us is that instantaneous pulse. But then there's light kind of off to the side, which is kind of around toward the side of the sun. That has to actually travel more distance to us. So we actually see that a little bit later. So that little pulse actually gets longer. Blue is because it's just really energetic and something really energetic. Very high energy. Uh, yeah, high energy is very hot and blue. And yeah, that's from the blue part. But the fact that this effect happens, you kind of it says how big this thing can be. And it says that all of this energy, which is happening and exploding very fast, comes from a relatively small source. And that makes it even more peculiar because you're thinking, okay, this has to be something really small, creating an enormous amount of energy, which is you know, the power of a supernova, over and over and over again, really been puzzling. That's got to be something like a black hole, surely. Well, that's what people go to first, and that is what it could be because black holes are small. Yep. and so, Or maybe a neutron star, because if you had this, if this thing, if, if, if these elephants are indeed some, massive star and they initially explode like a supernova, just an extreme case of a supernova, it would create like a black hole hydrogen star in its core. So if it does do that, well, maybe there is material that falls onto that black hole or neutron star, but that build becomes really hard to do. So what some people are saying, well, maybe these LFOs aren't stars at all. Maybe they're actually some sort of black hole, we'll say, for example, or a neutron star that's floating around a galaxy. And another star comes close to that, close enough to it, that it starts to orbit very close and, you know, really rapidly around it. And actually, because of that strong gravity, the tidal forces kind of start stretching that star and tear that star apart. And it could be something small like a white dwarf star, which is kind of the core of a star like our sun after it dies. So those are smaller, like the size of the Earth. Um, if you have something small like that being torn apart, that's going to create quite an extreme explosion. And maybe if you set up a scenario that if you're spinning around this black hole trying before you fall in and you're being torn apart, maybe your material is kind of spraying out around and you've got these streamers of material. And if that material comes and crashes upon itself, it and can cause you another. It could irregular bursts. It could. It could. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I take it the light curve doesn't look like anything from a gamma ray burst. Judging by what you've told me, the uh, the frequency doesn't match fast radio bursts either. That's right, because we did observe this in X-ray, radio, optical, etc. And this and luminous LS watts, luminous fast blue optical transient means that you know it's in the optical, which is unusual because we've got these fast radio bursts, which you you know about and people know about. So that's in the radio. And there are fast things like gamma ray bursts, but we really haven't seen something really powerful and really fast in the optic optical. But that's also kind of technological was a problem technologically. So now that we have faster digital cameras, wider field CCDs that can monitor the sky and see you know, loss detectors, we're actually now probing that faster, fainter optical regime. And, and it's always been my opinion that you know nature tends to fill up all of the possibilities <laughs> because we find things at about every brightness and at every, about every duration in different wavelengths. But we weren't seeing an optical. And I thought, well, I think it's just because we're not able to look. And now that we're able to, we're actually seeing these things. So it's really, it's really interesting. Any gravitational wave observations showing anything? Well, 
that would be a, a really good thing to help understand this. I think the problem here is that it's just a bit too far away, so uh-huh. they're not really sensitive to that. This yeah, thing is right. about redshift. I think it's like 0.25, so that, that ends up being you know, like a gigaparsec away or some number. I have to figure I think it's about 1.3 gigapars- gigaparsecs or so, and which is you know 1.3 billion parsecs. And I think gravitational wave detectors are really only sensitive to maybe you know a thousand or so if they're if the source is really massive. So you know you're really it's just too far away. So it's another mystery. Mysteries are yeah. fun. That's what science is all about. LF bots are rare. We've only found a few, even though we kind of scan the skies for them. But, you know, they're far and faint, and they're faint because they're so far. So, you know, there's don't really have a sense of the rate of them. But they're not a lot on the sky. But if they're bursting over and over and over like this, now you start realizing that you can have a lot of these bursts all over the place. So now that we know that this happened, you start looking for that, and, and hopefully we'll find more of these to try to figure them out. When this thing happened, it was a long, long way away. Were you able mm. to tell what area it came from? Was it from a galaxy? Was it near the center of the mm. galaxy or- one of the arms. Was that possible? Was it too far? It is. Uh, so we don't have like base, base high resolution of the galaxy, but we knew though it came from a galaxy. So the ground base, it looks kind of like a spiralish galaxy, but kind of, you know, not, it doesn't have like open arms or anything, but it's, it's more like an older spiral. And it's out off to the edge. So it's out about kiloparsecs, if that makes sense, from the center. So, it's, you know, it's almost kind of like... It's a super massive black hole then. It must be a stellar it's, black That's right. It's not, it's not in the center. It's almost kind of like how where we are in the Milky Way in yeah. a sense, you know, we're, we're ways off to the side, you know. How did you actually observe it? Yeah, so... It Initially, uh, there's this telescope called Wiki Transient Facility in the U.S. Uh, it kind of just scans the sky and looks for things, but provides like minimal data, like it finds a data point one night, here's something interesting. Then you have to follow it up with uh, other telescopes. So we followed up with about 15 other telescopes. How do you, what find, I did, how do you find out about that? Does it send you an SMS? Or? Uh, no, I mean, I wish. Uh, but there, well, there are some brokers that do that. I shouldn't say that. There are things that do that. In this case, for these kind of things, uh, Anna Ho, who's the, the lead author on this, has a program that has a software that searches the data for oh, things right. like this. Yeah. yeah, so there's like millions of of transients, you got to kind of sift through them all and figure out you know, what's what. So after you sift through them all and you find these things, then you get these crazy things. And what and what I did though is because we're trying to figure out what this is, we had a NASA Chandra X-ray telescope time to look at this to find out how much energy comes out in the X-ray if it when it bursts. And I was on the Keck Observatory, it's a, a 10 meter optical telescope in Hawaii, and we timed our observations to happen when the same time as the X-ray to see if it burst, how much would be in the optical and how much would be in the X-ray. And then it did burst, which was really good. So we're able to to kind of partition that out and try to figure out, helps try to figure out what it is. But there were other telescopes that have these uh, CMOS detectors, which are able to take like very fast, like sub-second images. And so you can monitor it over very fast time scales. And they were able to see it change like dramatically in just like 20 seconds. It got almost from faint to almost supernova brightness in like 20, 30 seconds. It's just really crazy. A weird light curve. It is very weird because it's also kind of ratty. It's like it's up and down, up and down. It's very jagged. It's not like a, a nice smooth a explosion. Of there as well. Well, wow. Yeah. It's really an interesting object. Because we kind of saw this first burst serendipitously, it's something that we say, oh, you know, we really should have been looking all along. So, uh, we need to find more of them to uh, figure out what they are. Was it visible in radio wavelengths at all? Uh, it was detected in radio. Okay. And and it's... Uh, Maybe Murchison may have like seen something. Thing. I don't know. Uh, Actually, that, that's a really good idea. Maybe there, Murchison could have, because that has more of an old yeah. guy read. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's actually a really good idea to, to look at some archival data and see if they've they've detected it. It might be a little faint for that, but we'll give it a go. That's a good idea. Thank you. (laughs) These things aren't as big as gamma ray bursts, are they? They are not as powerful in integrated energy, but I would say they are similar because do you know about superluminous supernovae? Yes. I study those. And so these actually are as bright as superluminous supernovae. Gamma ray bursts are uh, brighter because they're beamed. You know, you got to put that energy in like beam. beam, Yeah. Yeah, These, I think we think they're isotropic. So they're, they're not as bright, but if you integrate the light, they are. That makes sense. Like in all directions. Yeah. it's fascinating. It's it's brilliant. Mm. It's wonderful. It is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and it just makes us, you know, go back to the drawing board. Like, okay, you know, we thought something crazy like a superluminous supernova would explode and that's it, right? I mean, you, you just disrupted everything. But no, it keeps going. So you're like, okay, well, this has got to be something totally different. So we got to figure this out. That's Professor Jeff Cook from Swinburne University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, colliding neutron stars revealing some of their secrets. And Europe's Jew spacecraft undertaking a key engine burn in order to set course for Jupiter. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
Astronomers have identified the heavy element tellurium in the glowing embers of a pair of colliding neutron stars. The discovery, reported in the journal Nature, further confirms the hypothesis that these stellar collisions are the primary mechanism for producing the majority of the heaviest elements in the universe, including gold, platinum, iodine, plutonium and now tellurium. The authors made the discovery while they were examining one of the most powerful gamma-ray bursts ever observed. The blast was observed earlier this year on March 7, in a distant corner of the universe, but it was bright enough to be easily visible from Earth. Gamma-ray bursts are the most powerful explosions in the universe since the Big Bang. Their brief stellar blast, releasing as much energy in a few seconds as our Sun will produce in 10 billion years. But their exact details are still hotly debated among astronomers. See, we know gamma-ray bursts appear to be generated by two different origins. Short-period gamma-ray bursts, usually less than two seconds, are hypothesized to be produced by the merger of two neutron stars in a close binary system, generating what astronomers call a kilonova, the result of which is the production of a stellar mass black hole. On the other hand, long-period gamma-ray bursts, usually lasting more than two seconds, are hypothesized to be generated by the core collapse death of the universe's largest stars in what are known as hypernovae, or superluminous supernova explosions. During this process, two enormous beams of energy emitting plasma burst out from the core of the star. And if one of these extremely bright beams is pointed directly towards the Earth, the afterglow can be detected by both ground and space-based telescopes, even at cosmological distances. Now, These also mark the birth of a stellar mass black hole, or alternatively, a highly magnetised type of neutron star called a magnetar. Neutron stars are the stellar corpses of stars usually between 8 and 20 times the mass of our Sun. The deaths of these monsters are marked by powerful explosions called supernovae. The mechanics work something like this. When these stars run out of nuclear fuel to feed the core fusion process that makes the star shine, the outward push of energy from the nuclear fusion reaction, which normally balances the downward pressure of gravity, suddenly ends and gravity wins. The entire mass of these giant stars then instantaneously comes crashing down onto the core, crushing and condensing it, triggering an immense explosion called a core collapse supernova, a blast so bright it can outshine an entire galaxy. The crushed stellar core contains at least 1.4 times the mass of our Sun, but it's crushed into a super-dense ball just 20 kilometres across. This is what we call the neutron star. These are the densest objects in the universe other than black holes. In fact, just a teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh billions of tons. The stars destined to ultimately form neutron stars and their even more exotic companion stellar mass black holes are often found together in binary star systems. And over time, their orbits around each other contract until ultimately they merge together in a spectacular event called a kilonova. The initial burst was detected on March the 7th by the Fermi Gamma-ray Space Telescope. As well as their initial gamma rays and X-ray flashes, these bursts also produce longer-lasting afterglows of less energetic radiation, such as ultraviolet, visible light and infrared. The authors also pointed the Gemini South Telescope and the VLT, the Very Large Telescope in Chile, in the direction of the burst to gather more information. But the data revealed a puzzling result. The gamma-ray burst was rather long-lasting, over three minutes, which would normally imply that it was the result of a supernova. But the afterglow was much brighter in infrared than in visible light, and that's something not expected from a supernova. Instead, this infrared light hinted at a kilonova, explosion generated from the collision of two neutron stars. The study's authors then used the James Webb Space Telescope to study the event, finding it to be the second most powerful gamma-ray burst ever detected. The images from Webb established how exceptionally infrared the object really was, again a telltale sign of a kilonova. Not only did the data confirm that the burst did indeed emerge from a kilonova, Webb also had another surprise for the astronomers. See, kilonovae are theorised to be the main mechanism for producing the majority of the heavy elements in the universe. However, only a few kilonovae have actually been discovered so far, and in these only two heavy elements have ever been robustly detected, strontium and yttrium, with atomic numbers 38 and 39. 
Now, with this new discovery, astronomers can add a third heavy element to the list, tellurium, the 52nd element on the periodic table. One of the study's authors, Daniel bjorn Sonny from the Niels Bohr Institute in the Netherlands, says the discovery substantiates the idea that the creation of heavy elements happens when compact stellar objects merge. The detection also shows that kilonovae can emit very bright gamma-ray bursts, and conversely, that some bursts are pinpointing the locations of kilonovae. Interestingly, however, kilonovae were also expected to be detectable in gravitational waves, ripples in space-time that propagate outwards at the speed of light due to the extreme masses of their progenitor stars. But so far, only one example of such an event has been identified, and this new discovery wasn't detected. This is Space Time. Still to come. Europe's Jew spacecraft has undertaken a major engine burn in order to set its course for Jupiter. And later in the science report, planet Earth's average global temperature has smashed through a new record. All that and more still to come on Space Time. European Space Agency's Juice spacecraft has just undertaken one of the largest and most important manoeuvres of its eight-year journey to Jupiter. Using its main engine, Juice changed its orbit around the Sun in order to place itself on the correct trajectory for next year's Earth-Moon Double Gravity Assist, the first of its kind. The massive engine burn lasted 43 minutes and used up some 363 kilograms of fuel. That's 10% of the spacecraft's entire fuel reserves. It's the first of a two-part manoeuvre that could mark the final time that Juice's main engine is used until its arrival in the Jovian system in 2031. ACE's Juice, or Jupiter Ice Moons Explorer spacecraft, was launched from the crew's spaceport in French Guiana back on April the 14th. It's on a mission to make detailed observations of the solar system's largest planet and its three large ocean-bearing moons, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa. Spacecraft heading for the outer solar system regularly use planets to employ a gravity assist slingshot manoeuvre in order to help fling them along in their journey. Without gravity assist, missions to the outer solar system would require massive fuel tanks, feeding constantly burning rocket engines needed to have enough thrust to overcome the sun's gravity. Interestingly, Juice's first gravity assist boost will come from its home planet, the Earth, together with the Moon, when it does a close flyby past us in August 2024, more than a year after its launch. This will be a first-of-its-kind flyby. Juice will first pass the Moon to give it a little bit of extra kick, and then it will fly by the Earth one and a half days later to give it even more fling. But in order to get the most out of the gravity assist, Juice will have to arrive at the Earth-Moon system precisely at the right moment and at both the correct speed and angle. And that's where this just-completed manoeuvre came in. It was the first part of a two-part manoeuvre designed to put Juice on the correct trajectory for next year's encounter with the Earth and Moon. This first burn did 95% of the work, changing Juice's velocity by almost 200 metres per second. Juice is one of the heaviest interplanetary spacecraft ever launched, total mass of around 6,000 kilograms. And so it took a lot of force and consequently a lot of fuel in order to achieve the manoeuvre. In a few weeks, once mission managers have analysed Juice's new orbit, they'll carry out a second engine burn, a much smaller second part of the manoeuvre. Splitting the manoeuvre into two parts allows mission managers to use the second firing of the engine to iron out any inconsistencies from the first burn. An additional much smaller burn using Juice's smaller thrusters could then be carried out in May for a final fine-tuning during the approach to Earth. Juice spacecraft operations manager Ignacio Tanker says if all goes well with both parts of the manoeuvre, there likely won't be any need to use the main engine again until Juice enters orbit around Jupiter in 2031. Between now and then, they can use the small thrusters on the spacecraft to undertake any minor course corrections. But that doesn't mean nothing interesting will be happening before Juice's arrival at Jupiter. After the lunar Earth gravity assist, Juice will make a flyby of Venus in 2025 and then two further flybys of the Earth in 2026 and 2029. With each of these flybys, the spacecraft will gain more and more energy than what could be achieved through burning a reasonable amount of fuel, energy that will help it climb towards Jupiter against the pull of the Sun's gravity. 
The next time that JUICE will absolutely have to fire its main engine will be during its Jupiter orbit insertion manoeuvre. That won't happen until 2031. Just 13 hours after swinging by Ganymede and entering the Jupiter system, the spacecraft will need to slow down by about one kilometre per second, five times the change in velocity it just achieved. Once in orbit around the gas giant, JUICE can begin its exploration of the Jovian system. It'll undertake a series of 35 close flybys of the ocean moons. Where once flybys were a yearly occurrence, at Jupiter they'll be carried out as often as once every two weeks. These close-up encounters of the icy moons will allow the spacecraft and scientists back on Earth to gather the data needed to better understand these mysterious alien worlds. This report from ESA TV. The giant planet Jupiter is a place of intrigue and mystery. A special environment within our own solar system. When Galileo first raised his telescope to the planet, he discovered four moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Early space probes raised more questions than answers about this fascinating gas giant planet and its intriguing moons. Now, those answers are within our grasp. The Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, JUICE. JUICE is equipped with the most powerful science payload ever sent to the outer solar system. 10 instruments will conduct the most comprehensive remote sensing, geophysical and in situ measurements ever performed at Jupiter. To bring JUICE to life, ESA has led a consortium of more than 2,000 people in 23 countries, working in 18 institutions and 83 companies. NASA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and the Israel Space Agency have all supplied hardware. For eight years, JUICE will cruise through space before beginning a complex series of manoeuvres in the Jupiter system. During this time, JUICE will face many dangers. Radiation near Jupiter can fry the spacecraft's electronic brain. The planet's gravitational pull is so large, it could threaten derailment. Nevertheless, ESA's expert spacecraft operators will guide JUICE through 35 flybys of Europa, Ganymede and Callisto before orbiting Ganymede. But the dangers will be worth it for the science that JUICE will uncover. Europa and Ganymede are thought to contain subsurface oceans that could hold more water than Earth's oceans. JUICE will explore these moons to study whether life could arise in different environments across the cosmos. JUICE will also study Jupiter's complex weather, chemistry and climate in detail. It will turn Jupiter into a standard reference for us to compare against other gas giant planets throughout the cosmos. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Planet Earth's average global temperature has now smashed through the 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels threshold for the first time. The European Union's Copernicus Climate Change Service says satellite observations show the planet reached 2.06 degrees Celsius hotter than average levels before industrialisation between 1850 and 1900. The new record set on November 17th does not mean the world is in a permanent state of warming above 2 degrees. But it is a symptom that the planet is steadily getting hotter and moving towards a longer-term situation where climate crisis impacts will be difficult and maybe even impossible to reverse. The November 17 record temperature was also 1.17 degrees above the 1991 to 2020 average levels, making it the warmest November 17 on record. A new study has confirmed earlier research showing that swapping animal-based foods for plant-based diets could reduce your risk of health conditions such as heart disease or type 2 diabetes and consequently an early death. The new findings, reported in the British Medical Journal, summarise findings from 37 previous studies, which were mostly collecting information about diet from questionnaires. 
they found that swapping processed meats with nuts or legumes reduced the risk of heart disease, type 2 diabetes, consequently earlier death, or swapping one egg per day with nuts or whole grains was associated with a reduced risk of heart disease or diabetes. Loneliness could be associated with an increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. The findings, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, are based on data from 491,603 people who were monitored for up to 15 years. The authors found loneliness was associated with an increased risk of Parkinson's disease, even when demographic and socioeconomic factors, as well as social isolation, genetic risk and physical and mental health, were taken into account. Now, this study cannot show whether loneliness causes Parkinson's disease or vice versa only that there is a link. And the researchers admit there are many other possible interpretations of the data, including that loneliness might come with other early common symptoms of the disease, including depression, fatigue, anxiety and apathy. A new study has found that what was formerly seen to be a women believe more than men assumption about the paranormal is inaccurate. However, it appears that the sort of supernatural phenomena one believes in, such as ghosts versus aliens, can depend on which gender you identify as. Also, different studies are finding different patterns, which further complicates things. It's not completely clear why there should be a gender difference in paranormal belief in the first place. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says different theories abound and the inconsistencies in the research add to the lack of clarity. Some research recently done looking at belief in the paranormal, a whole range of different things, ghosts, Bigfoot, all those usual stuff. Traditionally, and this is probably purely anecdotal information in the past, it was regarded that men were more likely to believe in physical phenomena like Bigfoot, UFOs, that sort of stuff, whereas women were more likely to believe in the spiritual side of things, which would be ghosts, non-corporeal, if you like, ghosts. Carrot cards, that sort of thing, yeah. That sort of thing, yeah. So it was, it was a, that was where the line was drawn. It was always dodgy, right, that so that was the actual case. As the whole but obviously, is, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, obviously that people run the gamut across the whole thing as to who believes what. But they were just saying there was a propensity of male, female. Yeah, that's the uh, way I always figured it too, yeah, that guys were into UFOs and Bigfoot and... Loch Ness monsters and releasing the Kraken and and the chicks were into tarot cards and spirit readings and what your dead relatives are thinking. Yeah, you could almost say that the men were believed in things that could hurt and women were believing in things that would help you in a way. Which Isn't is interesting. that interesting? I didn't think of it that way, but yeah. Well, there we are. Doesn't that solve the gender issue? It, it actually comments quite a lot, actually. Yes. But, but what they're saying is that it's getting muddier. As you're getting sort of socially accepted variations in gender, right, and certainly what people believe their gender to be, there's, there's birth gender, there's psychological gender, there's a whole range of different genders that really as a society many people are coming to grips with if at all but they're suggesting this research and of course it's one of those bits of research that always ends off with a line need more research of course Thank you very much. get more funding that's right can't you come to a conclusion on this but they are saying that the inconsistencies in that original idea of the male female split is becoming more and more evident for instance yes there is still a tendency of belief in certain things according to certain gender but when the gender becomes more fluid especially in the self-perception of the gender, how people see themselves rather than necessarily physical issues, that will affect the belief in the paranormal. And that when people are described in this article as non-conformists, which is a sort of a very strange term to use, but it means that the people not following the traditional you know, male, female, black and white sort of differentiation, these non-conformists were more likely to believe in all paranormal phenomena compared to people whose gender expression was more traditional, right, reflecting of their identity. And when you're looking at Bigfoot, aliens, ghosts, ability to see the future, and telekinesis, that was the five areas they were looking at. They're suggesting that the way you see yourself is just as, if not more important, than physicalities and that sort of medical basis of what people are. So if you tend to sort of think of yourself as more female, more female, not entirely, but yeah, more female, you might tend to have more female beliefs. But the people who are all over the place, if you like, or in a, in a different situation, non-conformists, they tend to believe they take both sides of the, of the equation and believe in all of these phenomena. No? That's what this research was saying. It's one piece of research, and as they always say, that we need more research. But overall, what they're saying is that belief in the paranormal may have more to do with how someone's gender expression matches up with their social expectations than with their identity. So it's how they want to be rather than how they are. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the 
the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 